Section 14 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 14. THE BORGIAS, CHAPTER Seven, PART One. Matters went forward as Alexander had wished, and before the end of the year the pontifical army had seized a great number of castles and fortresses that belonged to the Orsini, who thought themselves already lost when Charles the Eighth came to the rescue. They had addressed themselves to him without much hope that he could be of real use to them, with his want of armed troops and his preoccupation with his own affairs. He, however, sent Carlo Orsini, son of Virginio the prisoner, and Vitellozzo Vitelli, brother of Camillo Vitelli, one of the three valiant Italian condottieri who had joined him and fought for him at the crossing of the Taro. These two captains, whose courage and skill were well known, brought with them a considerable sum of money from the liberal coffers of Charles the Eighth. Now scarcely had they arrived at Cita di Castello, the centre of their little sovereignty, and expressed their intention of raising a band of soldiers, when men presented themselves from all sides to fight under their banner. So they very soon assembled a small army, and, as they had been able during their stay among the French, to study those matters of military organization in which France excelled, they now applied the result of their learning to their own troops. The improvements were mainly certain changes in the artillery which made their maneuvers easier, and the substitution for their ordinary weapons of pikes similar in form to the Swiss pikes, but two feet longer. These changes effected, Vitellozzo Vitelli spent three or four months in exercising his men in the management of their new weapons. Then, when he thought them fit to make good use of these, and when he had collected more or less help from the towns of Perugia, Todi, and Narni, where the inhabitants trembled lest their turn should come after the Orsinis, as the Orsinis had followed on the Colonnas, he marched towards Bracciano, which was being besieged by the Duke of Urbino, who had been lent to the Pope by the Venetians in virtue of the treaty quoted above. The Venetian general, when he heard of Vitelli's approach, thought he might as well spare him half his journey, and marched out to confront him. The two armies met in the Soriano road, and the battle straightway began. The pontifical army had a body of eight hundred Germans, on which the dukes of Urbino and Gandia chiefly relied, as well they might, for they were the best troops in the world. But Vitelli attacked these picked men with his infantry, who, armed with their formidable pikes, ran them through, while they, with arms four feet shorter, had no chance even of returning the blows they received. At the same time Vitelli's light troops wheeled upon the flank, following their most rapid movements, and silencing the enemy's artillery by the swiftness and accuracy of their attack. The pontifical troops were put to flight, though after a longer resistance than might have been expected when they had to sustain the attack of an army so much better equipped than their own. With them they bore to Ronciglioni, the Duke of Gandia, wounded in the face by a pike thrust, Fabrizia Colonna, and the envoy. The Duke of Urbino, who was fighting in the rear to aid the retreat, was taken prisoner with all his artillery and the baggage of the conquered army. But this success, great as it was, did not so swell the pride of Vitellozzo Vitelli as to make him oblivious of his position. He knew that he and the Orsini together were too weak to sustain a war of such magnitude, that the little store of money to which he owed the existence of his army would very soon be expended, and his army would disappear with it. So he hastened to get pardoned for the victory by making propositions which he would very likely have refused had he been the vanquished party, and the Pope accepted his conditions without demur. 
during the interval having heard that trevulce had just recrossed the alps and re-entered italy with three thousand swiss and fearing lest the italian general might only be the advance guard of the king of france so it was settled that the orsini should pay seventy thousand florins for the expenses of the war and that all the prisoners on both sides should be exchanged without ransom with the single exception of the duke of urbino as a pledge for the future payment of the seventy thousand florins the orsini handed over to the cardinals sforza and san severino the fortresses of anguillara and servetri then when the day came and they had not the necessary money they gave up their prisoner the duke of urbino estimating his worth at forty thousand ducats nearly all the sum required and handed him over to alexander on account he a rigid observer of engagements made his own general taken prisoner in his service pay to himself the ransom he owed to the enemy then the pope had the corpse of virginio sent to carlo orsini and vitellozzo vitelli as he could not send him alive by a strange fatality the prisoner had died eight days before the treaty was signed of the same malady at least if we may judge by analogy that had carried off bajazet's brother as soon as the peace was signed prospero colonna and gonzalvo de cordova whom the pope had demanded from frederick arrived at rome with an army of spanish and neapolitan troops alexander as he could not utilize these against the orsini set them the work of recapturing ostia not desiring to incur the reproach of bringing them to rome for nothing gonzalvo was rewarded for this feat by receiving the rose of gold from the pope's hand that being the highest honor his holiness can grant he shared this distinction with the emperor maximilian the king of france the doge of venice and the marquis of mantua in the midst of all this occurred the solemn festival of the assumption in which gonzalvo was invited to take part he accordingly left his palace proceeded in great pomp in the front of the pontifical cavalry and took his place on the duke of gandia's left hand the duke attracted all eyes by his personal beauty set off as it was by all the luxury he thought fit to display at this festival he had a retinue of pages and servants clad in sumptuous liveries incomparable for richness with anything heretofore seen in rome that city of religious pomp all these pages and servants rode magnificent horses caparisoned in velvet trimmed with silver fringe and bells of silver hanging down every here and there he himself was in a robe of gold brocade and wore at his neck a string of eastern pearls perhaps the finest and largest that ever belonged to a christian prince while on his cap was a gold chain studded with diamonds of which the smallest was worth more than twenty thousand ducats this magnificence was all the more conspicuous by the contrast it presented to caesar's dress whose scarlet robe admitted of no ornaments the result was that caesar doubly jealous of his brother felt a new hatred rise up within him when he heard all along the way the praises of his fine appearance and noble equipment from this moment cardinal valentino decided in his own mind the fate of this man this constant obstacle in the path of his pride his love and his ambition very good reason says tommaso the historian had the duke of gandia to leave behind him an impression on the public mind of his beauty and his grandeur at this fate for this last display was soon to be followed by the obsequies of the unhappy young man lucrezia also had come to rome on the pretext of taking part in the solemnity but really as we shall see later with the view of serving as a new instrument for her father's ambition as the pope was not satisfied with an empty triumph of vanity and display for his son and as his war with the orsini had failed to produce the anticipated results 
he decided to increase the fortune of his firstborn by doing the very thing which he had accused Calixtus in his speech of doing for him, viz., alienating from the states of the church the cities of Benevento, Terracino, and Ponticorvo to form a duchy as an appanage to his son's house. Accordingly, this proposition was put forward in a full consistory, and, as the College of Cardinals was entirely Alexander's, there was no difficulty about carrying his point. This new favor to his elder brother exasperated Caesar, although he was himself getting a share of the paternal gifts, for he had just been named envoy a la terre at Frederick's court, and was appointed to crown him with his own hands as the papal representative. But Lucrezia, when she had spent a few days of pleasure with her father and brothers, had gone into retreat at the convent of San Sisto. No one knew the real motive of her seclusion, and no entreaties of Caesar, whose love for her was strange and unnatural, had induced her to defer this departure from the world even until the day after he left for Naples. His sister's obstinacy wounded him deeply, for ever since the day when the Duke of Gandia had appeared in the procession so magnificently attired, he fancied he had observed a coldness in the mistress of his illicit affection, and so far did this increase his hatred of his rival that he resolved to be rid of him at all costs. So he ordered the chief of his Sibiri to come and see him the same night. Michelotto was accustomed to these mysterious messages, which almost always meant his help was wanted in some love affair or some act of revenge. As in either case his reward was generally a large one, he was careful to keep his engagement, and at the appointed hour was brought into the presence of his patron. Caesar received him leaning against a tall chimney-piece, no longer wearing his cardinal's robe and hat, but a doublet of black velvet slashed with satin of the same color. One hand toyed mechanically with his gloves, while the other rested on the handle of a poisoned dagger which never left his side. This was the dress he kept for his nocturnal expeditions, so Michelotto felt no surprise at that. But his eyes burned with a flame more gloomy than their wont, and his cheeks, generally pale, were now livid. Michelotto had but to cast one look upon his master to see that Caesar and he were about to share some terrible enterprise. He signed to him to shut the door. Michelotto obeyed. Then, after a moment's silence, during which the eyes of Borgia seemed to burn into the soul of the bravo, who, with a careless air, stood bareheaded before him, he said, in a voice whose slightly mocking tone gave the only sign of his emotion, Michelotto, how do you think this dress suits me? Accustomed as he was to his master's tricks of circumlocution, the bravo was so far from expecting this question that at first he stood mute, and only after a few moments' pause was able to say, "'Admirably, Monsignore. Thanks to the dress, your Excellency has the appearance as well as the true spirit of a captain.' "'I am glad you think so,' replied Cesar. "'And now let me ask you, do you know who is the cause that instead of wearing this dress, which I can only put on at night, I am forced to disguise myself in the daytime in a cardinal's robe and hat, and pass my time trotting about from church to church?' from consistory to consistory, when I ought properly to be leading a magnificent army in the battlefield, where you would enjoy a captain's rank, instead of being the chief of a few miserable sbiri. Yes, Monsignore, replied Michelotto, who had divined Cesar's meaning at his first word. The man who is the cause of this is Francesco, Duke of Gandia and Benevento, your elder brother. "'Do you know,' Cesar resumed, giving no sign of assent, but a nod and a bitter smile, "'do you know who has all the money and none of the genius, who has the helmet and none of the brains, who has the sword and no hand to wield it?' "'That, too, is the Duke of Gandia,' said Michelotto. 
"'Do you know,' continued César, "'who is the man whom I find continually blocking the path of my ambition, my fortune, and my love?' "'It is the same, the Duke of Gandia,' said Micoloto. "'And what do you think of it?' asked César. "'I think he must die,' replied the man coldly. "'That is my opinion also, Micoloto,' said César, stepping towards him and grasping his hand. "'And my only regret is that I did not think of it sooner, for if I had carried a sword at my side instead of a crozier in my hand when the King of France was marching through Italy, I should now have been the master of a fine domain. The Pope is obviously anxious to aggrandize his family, but he is mistaken in the means he adopts.' It is I who ought to have been made duke, and my brother a cardinal. There is no doubt at all that had he made me duke, I should have contributed a daring and courage to his service that would have made his power far weightier than it is. The man who would make his way to vast dominions and a kingdom ought to trample underfoot all the obstacles in his path, and boldly grasp the very sharpest thorns, whatever reluctance his weak flesh may feel. Such a man, if he would open out his path to fortune, should seize his dagger or his sword, and strike out with his eyes shut. He should not shrink from bathing his hands in the blood of his kindred. He should follow the example offered him by every founder of empire, from Romulus to Bajazet, both of whom climbed to the throne by the ladder of fratricide. Yes, Micoloto, as you say, such is my condition, and I am resolved I will not shrink. Now you know why I sent for you. Am I wrong in counting upon you? As might have been expected, Micoloto, seeing his own fortune in this crime, replied that he was entirely at Cesar's service, and that he had nothing to do but to give his orders as to time, place, and manner of execution. Cesar replied that the time must needs be very soon, since he was on the point of leaving Rome for Naples. As to the place and the mode of execution, they would depend on circumstances, and each of them must look out for an opportunity and seize the first that seemed favorable. End of section 14「Section 15 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 15. The Borgias. CHAPTER Seven, PART Two. Two days after this resolution had been taken, César learned that the day of his departure was fixed for Thursday the 15th of June. At the same time he received an invitation from his mother to come to supper with her on the 14th. This was a farewell repast given in his honor. Micoloto received orders to be in readiness at eleven o'clock at night. The table was set in the open air in a magnificent vineyard, a property of Rosa Venoza's in the neighborhood of San Piero in Vinculus. The guests were César Borgia, the hero of the occasion, the Duke of Gandia, the Prince of Squillas, Dona Sancha, his wife, the Cardinal of Monte Reale, Francesco Borgia, son of Calixtus III, Don Rodrigo Borgia, captain of the Apostolic Palace, Don Goffredo, brother of the Cardinal, John Borgia, at that time the ambassador at Perugia, and lastly Don Alfonso Borgia, the Pope's nephew. The whole family, therefore, was present except Lucrezia, who was still in retreat and would not come. The repast was magnificent. Cesar was quite as cheerful as usual, and the Duke of Gandia seemed more joyous than he had ever been before. In the middle of supper a man in a mask brought him a letter. The duke unfastened it, coloring up with pleasure, and when he had read it, answered in these words, I will come. Then he quickly hid the letter in the pocket of his doublet. 
but quick as he was to conceal it from every eye, Cesar had had time to cast a glance that way, and he fancied he recognized the handwriting of his sister Lucrezia. Meanwhile the messenger had gone off with his answer, no one but Cesar paying the slightest attention to him, for at that period it was the custom for messages to be conveyed by men in domino, or by women whose faces were concealed by a veil. At ten o'clock they rose from the table, and, as the air was sweet and mild, they walked about a while under the magnificent pine-trees that shaded the house of Rosa Venoza, while Cesar never for an instant let his brother out of his sight. At eleven o'clock the Duke of Gandia bade good-night to his mother. Cesar at once followed suit, alleging his desire to go to the Vatican to bid farewell to the Pope, as he would not be able to fulfill this duty on the morrow, his departure being fixed at daybreak. This pretext was all the more plausible, since the Pope was in the habit of sitting up every night till two or three o'clock in the morning. The two brothers went out together, mounted their horses, which were waiting for them at the door, and rode side by side as far as the Palazzo Borgia, the present home of Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, who had taken it as a gift from Alexander the night before his election to the papacy. There the Duke of Gandia separated from his brother, saying with a smile that he was not intending to go home, as he had several hours to spend first with a fair lady who was expecting him. Cesar replied that he was no doubt free to make any use he liked best of his opportunities, and wished him a very good night. The Duke turned to the right and Cesar to the left, but Cesar observed that the street the duke had taken led in the direction of the convent of San Sisto, where, as we said, Lucrezia was in retreat. His suspicions were confirmed by this observation, and he directed his horse's steps to the Vatican, found the Pope, took his leave of him, and received his benediction. From this moment all is wrapped in mystery and darkness, like that in which the terrible deed was done that we are now to relate. This, however, is what is believed. The Duke of Gandia, when he quitted Cesar, sent away his servants, and in the company of one confidential valet alone, pursued his course towards the Piazza della Giudecca. There he found the same man in a mask who had come to speak to him at supper, and, forbidding his valet to follow any farther, he bade him wait on the piazza where they then stood, promising to be on his way back in two hours' time at latest, and to take him up as he passed. And at the appointed hour the duke reappeared, took leave this time of the man in the mask, and retraced his steps towards his palace. But scarcely had he turned the corner of the Jewish ghetto when four men on foot, led by a fifth who was on horseback, flung themselves upon him. Thinking they were thieves, or else that he was the victim of some mistake, the Duke of Gandia mentioned his name, but instead of the name checking the murderer's daggers, their strokes were redoubled, and the Duke very soon fell dead, his valet dying beside him. Then the man on horseback, who had watched the assassination with no sign of emotion, backed his horse towards the dead body. The four murderers lifted the corpse across the crupper, and, walking side by side to support it, then made their way down the lane that leads to the church of Santa Maria in Monticelli. The wretched valet they left for dead upon the pavement. But he, after a lapse of a few seconds, regained some small strength, and his groans were heard by the inhabitants of a poor little house hard by. They came and picked him up, and laid him upon a bed, where he died almost at once, unable to give any evidence as to the assassins, or any details of the murder. All night the Duke was expected home, and all the next morning. Then expectation was turned into fear, and fear at last into deadly terror. The Pope was approached, and told that the Duke of Gandia had never come back to his palace since he left his mother's house. But Alexander tried to deceive himself all through the rest of the day, 
hoping that his son might have been surprised by the coming of daylight in the midst of an amorous adventure, and was waiting till the next night to get away in that darkness which had aided his coming thither. But the night, like the day, passed and brought no news. On the morrow the Pope, tormented by the gloomiest presentiments and by the raven's croak of the vox populi, let himself fall into the depths of despair. Amid sighs and sobs of grief all he could say to any one who came to him was but these words repeated a thousand times. Search, search, let us know how my unhappy son has died. Then everybody joined in the search, for, as we have said, the Duke of Gandia was beloved by all, but nothing could be discovered from scouring the town except the body of the murdered man, who was recognized as the Duke's valet. Of his master there was no trace whatever. It was then thought, not without reason, that he had probably been thrown into the Tiber, and they began to follow along its banks, beginning from the Via della Ripetta questioning every boatman and fisherman who might possibly have seen, either from their houses or from their boats, what had happened on the river banks during the two preceding nights. At first all inquiries were in vain, but when they had gone up as high as the Via del Fantanone, they found a man at last who said he had seen something happen on the night of the 14th, which might very possibly have some bearing on the subject of the inquiry. He was a Slav named George, who was taking up the river a boat laden with wood to Repetta. The following are his own words. Gentlemen, he said, last Wednesday evening, when I had set down my load of wood on the bank, I remained in my boat, resting in the cool night air, and watching lest other men should come and take away what I had just unloaded. When, about two o'clock in the morning, I saw coming out of the lane on the left of San Girolamo's church two men on foot, who came forward in the middle of the street, and looked so carefully all around that they seemed to have come to find out if anybody was going along the street. When they felt sure that it was deserted, they went back along the same lane, whence issued presently two other men, who used similar precautions to make sure that there was nothing fresh. They, when they found all as they wished, gave a sign to their companions to come and join them. Next appeared one man on a dapple-gray horse, which was carrying on the crupper the body of a dead man, his head and arms hanging over on one side and his feet on the other. The two fellows I had first seen exploring were holding him up by the arms and legs. The other three at once went up to the river, while the first two kept a watch on the street, and advancing to the part of the bank where the sewers of the town are discharged into the Tiber, the horseman turned his horse, backing on the river. Then the two who were at either side, taking the corpse, one by the hands, the other by the feet, swung it three times, and the third time threw it out into the river with all their strength. Then, at the noise made when the body splashed into the river, the horseman asked, Is it done? And the others answered, Yes, sir, and he at once turned right about face. But seeing the dead man's cloak floating, he asked, What was that black thing swimming about? Sir, said one of the men, it is his cloak. And then another man picked up some stones, and running to the place where it was still floating, threw them so as to make it sink under. As soon as it had quite disappeared, they went off, and after walking a little way along the main road, they went into the lane that leads to San Giacomo. That was all I saw, gentlemen, and so it is all I can answer to the questions you have asked me. At these words, which robbed of all hope any who might yet entertain it, one of the Pope's servants asked the Slav why, when he was witness of such a deed, he had not gone to denounce it to the governor. But the Slav replied that, since he had exercised his present trade on the riverside, he had seen dead men thrown into the Tiber in the same way a hundred times, and had never heard that anybody had been troubled about them. 
so he supposed it would be the same with this corpse as the others, and had never imagined it was his duty to speak of it, not thinking it would be any more important than it had been before. Acting on this intelligence, the servants of His Holiness summoned at once all boatmen and fishermen who were accustomed to go up and down the river, and as a large reward was promised to any one who should find the Duke's body, there were soon more than a hundred ready for the job so that before the evening of the same day, which was Friday, two men were drawn out of the water, of whom one was instantly recognized as the hapless duke. At the very first glance at the body there could be no doubt as to the cause of death. It was pierced with nine wounds, the chief one in the throat, whose artery was cut. The clothing had not been touched, his doublet and cloak were there, his gloves in his waistband, gold in his purse. The duke then must have been assassinated, not for gain, but for revenge. The ship which carried the corpse went up the Tiber to the Castello Sant'Angelo, where it was set down. At once the magnificent dress was fetched from the duke's palace which he had worn on the day of the procession, and he was clothed in it once more. Beside him were placed the insignia of the generalship of the church. Thus he lay in state all day, but his father in his despair had not the courage to come and look at him. At last, when night had fallen, his most trusty and honored servants carried the body to the church of the Madonna del Papala, with all the pomp and ceremony that church and state combined could devise for the funeral of the son of the Pope. Meantime the blood-stained hands of Cesar Borgia were placing a royal crown upon the head of Frederick of Aragon. This blow had pierced Alexander's heart very deeply. As at first he did not know on whom his suspicions should fall, he gave the strictest orders for the pursuit of the murderers. But little by little the infamous truth was forced upon him. He saw that the blow which struck at his house came from that very house itself, and then his despair was changed to madness. He ran through the rooms of the Vatican like a maniac, and entering the consistory with torn garments and ashes on his head, he sobbingly avowed all the errors of his past life, owning that the disaster that struck his offspring through his offspring was a just chastisement from God. Then he retired to a secret dark chamber of the palace, and there shut himself up, declaring his resolve to die of starvation. And indeed for more than sixty hours he took no nourishment by day nor rest by night, making no answer to those who knocked at his door to bring him food, except with the wailings of a woman, or a roar as of a wounded lion. Even the beautiful Julia Farnese, his new mistress, could not move him at all, and was obliged to go and seek Lucrezia, that daughter doubly loved, to conquer his deadly resolve. Lucrezia came out from the retreat where she was weeping for the Duke of Gandia, that she might console her father. At her voice the door did really open, and it was only then that the Duke of Segovia, who had been kneeling almost a whole day at the threshold, begging his holiness to take heart, could enter with servants bearing wine and food. The Pope remained alone with Lucrezia for three days and nights. Then he reappeared in public, outwardly calm, if not resigned, for Guicciardini assures us that his daughter had made him understand how dangerous it would be to himself to show too openly before the assassin, who was coming home, the immoderate love he felt for his victim. End of section 15